souls belated. The railway carriage had been full when the train left Bologna, but at the first station beyond Milan, their only remaining companion, a courtly person who ate garlic out of a carpet bag, had left his crumb-strewn seat with a bow. Lydia's eye regretfully followed the shiny broadcloth of his retreating back till it lost itself in the cloud of touts and cab drivers hanging about the station. Then she glanced across at Gannett and caught the same regret in his look. They were both sorry to be alone. Partenza! shouted the guard. The train vibrated to a sudden slamming of doors. A waiter ran along the platform with a tray of fossilised sandwiches. A belated porter flung a bundle of shawls and bandboxes into a third-class carriage. The guard snapped out a brief Partenza! which indicated the purely ornamental nature of his first shout, and the train swung out of the station. The direction of the road had changed, and a shaft of sunlight struck across the dusty red velvet seats into Lydia's corner. Gannett did not notice it. He had returned to his Revue de Paris, and she had to rise and lower the shade of the farther window. Against the vast horizon of their leisure, such incidents stood out sharply. Having lowered the shade, Lydia sat down, leaving the length of the carriage between herself and Gannett. At length, he missed her and looked up. I moved out of the sun, she hastily explained. He looked at her curiously. The sun was beating on her through the shade. Very well, he said pleasantly, adding, You don't mind? as he drew a cigarette case from his pocket. It was a refreshing touch, relieving the tension of her spirit, with the suggestion that after all, if he could smoke, the relief was only momentary. Her experience of smokers was limited. Her husband had disapproved of the use of tobacco, but she knew from hearsay that men sometimes smoked to get away from things, that a cigar might be the masculine equivalent of darkened windows and a headache. Gannett, after a puff or two, returned to his review. It was just as she had foreseen. He feared to speak as much as she did. It was one of the misfortunes of their situation that they were never busy enough to necessitate or even to justify the postponement of unpleasant discussions. If they avoided a question, it was obviously unconcealably because the question was disagreeable. They had unlimited leisure and an accumulation of mental energy to devote to any subject that presented itself... New topics were, in fact, at a premium. Lydia sometimes had premonitions of a famine-stricken period when there would be nothing left to talk about, and she had already caught herself doling out piecemeal what in the first prodigality of their confidences she would have flung to him in a breath. Their silence, therefore, might simply mean that they had nothing to say, but it was another disadvantage of their position that it allowed infinite opportunity for the classification of minute differences. Lydia had learnt to distinguish between real and factitious silences, and under Gannett's she now detected a hum of speech to which her own thoughts made breathless answer. How could it be otherwise, with that thing between them? She glanced up at the rack overhead. The thing was there, in her dressing bag, symbolically suspended over her head and his... He was thinking of it now, just as she was. They had been thinking of it in unison ever since they had entered the train. While the carriage had held other travellers, they had screened her from his thoughts, but now that he and she were alone, she knew exactly what was passing through his mind. She could almost hear him asking himself what he should say to her. The thing had come that morning, brought up to her in an innocent-looking envelope with the rest of their letters, as they were leaving the hotel at Bologna. As she tore it open, she and Gannett were laughing over some ineptitude of the local guidebook. They had been driven of late to make the most of such incidental humours of travel. Even when she had unfolded the document, she took it for some unimportant business paper sent abroad for her signature, and her eye travelled inattentively over the curly whereases of the preamble until a word arrested her.